morning, good morning, buongiorno. I think I will stick with, stick with these three. <laughs> Welcome to the second full day of our conference. Welcome to our zweiten, our zweiten vollen Tag unserer Konferenz. Welcome to the second day of our, our conference. Wonderful, um, a wonderful day. Please come in, there is more seats here in the front. As I said, nobody was bites, so you can come closer. <laughs> I will go and speak in English, and uh, you can find, as usual, on the Canal 2, the English translation of Canal 1, finden Sie die Deutsch Übersetzung. Channel 1, you Thank find you. the Spanish German Today is Spanish will be on Channel 3 today. So I'm thrilled to be here today and having a chance to introduce to you our wonderful speakers. I'm going to do it in a, in a minute. I first have a few announcements to make. This is a big conference. I don't have a lot of things going on, and they are going on wonderfully because we have a great number of helpers. And thank you to all of you who has been willing to help us with the conference. We need more helpers. So if anybody feels like offering a couple of hours to help out, please go at the desk there and, and tell them that you'd be willing to help for two or four, or four hours a day. That'd be great. Thank you. Also, it's very important that you register. Even if you have registered for the conference online, please do not forget to go to the, the info point, which is this big spice, spice, spice uh, um, <laughs> thing which is that in the foyer, in the hall at the entrance. Please go there and register for the conference. It's very important for us. And we get this wonderful bracelet, which also allows you to use the public transportation in the city of Leipzig. Um, unfortunately, I also have uh, to give, to give a um, less happy announcement. The, car, the, the courtyard in, in the middle of, of the buildings is an open access space. Everybody can come. So uh, please take care of your stuff. Uh, don't leave it your stuff unattended because uh, somebody has, there have been some uh, pickpocketers yesterday. So please don't leave stuff which is valuable to you unattended in a courtyard. And, generally in the university buildings, because it, this is open, open spaces. Thank you. Another nice announcement is that there is more food than you think. Uh, we, <laughs> so um, more of you can uh, take, take the food from the courtyard, uh, from the focus. And, uh, and the line is faster than you think. It's quite well organized. So even if it looks scary, if you see such a long line, it's quite fast. So, and the food is quite tasty as well. So just try it today. <laughs> Another reminder, again, let me remind you that if you want to submit a proposal for the open space, you should do it today, as every day, before 1.30 p.m. Again, in the foyer, in the, in the, in the hall. And, uh, uh, and as, as, you, as you know, then around four, you will have the program of a different open space um, workshop, which is self-organized. And yesterday, we had a bunch of them. Thank you for that. It's wonderful. So if you feel that something is missing in this conference, just do it. And the very last announcement that I have, you find in your bags also a survey which has been developed by the colleague, my colleagues at the Sociology uh, Institute of the University of Vienna. It's an, the first attempt to really map who we are. So it would be great if you take a few minutes to fill that survey and there are boxes all over the places where you can just post it after you have filled it. Please think about that, do that before you leave. It will be a great help and all the results will be available. It will take a while to, 
you know, to work on that, but it will be available for all and it will be a very important source of information about who we are, where we come from, uh, and who is everything, everybody here. I think there are no more announcements. Okay. So, now let me start and uh, as I said, it's uh, not only an honor, but it's a great pleasure to introduce to you the speakers that we have today. Adel Haibizeka, who is already sitting here, I'm going to say a few words about her, and Sunita Narayan, who is going to join us uh, via um, online, via Skype. Hopefully, everything will work fine. Um, let me start by introducing to you um, the first speech we're going to hear. As you note, that today, uh, the, the motto of the day is building alliances, and this is very important. For, for quite a long time in the degrowth debate, the, pers the feminist perspective and the perspective of what Adelheid calls the reproductive activities has been somehow underrepresented. In the last years, however, there have been an incre increasing attention to um, to these uh, topics and to these And this is why we are very happy to hear one of the greatest experts on this topic. She has been, been fighting for that and fighting for having this attention to this aspect for all her life, very successfully in Germany and also internationally. Adelheid Bizeka was born in 1942. She's a, she is a professor of economic theory at the University of Bremen in Germany. Her work focuses on microeconomics from a socio-ecological perspective, ecological economics, feminist economics, and obviously the connection between the three, and the future of work. She's a member of the network Precautionary Economy in German, Netzwerk Vorsorgenes Wirtschaften, and a member of the Association for Ecological Economics. She will give us a wonderful talk on the re, which is written in brackets, the reproductivity as an economic paradigm for a social ecological economy. Please help me welcoming Adelheid Bizeka. Thank you very much, Barbara, for this very kind uh, introduction. And we have a new format today. We have English uh, slides and a German text. For the, Germans, uh, li for the German listeners who don't have translation, what I'm going to do, I will adhere to the text of the slides. I will give a translation so that you know what um, the slides are talking about but as i said i will speak in german i speak english as well but i prefer prefer speaking english of course i prefer speaking german of course barbara had a, a wonderful uh, speech yesterday and talked about the dimension of transformation and the first one she mentioned was structures and institutions it's the economy with its production consumption and uh, labor and barbara's uh, topic was the social imaginary now my first uh, my topic today is the first um, dimension the, the economic dimension now, let me give you a preliminary re remark so that you understand in which analytical framework I'm um, working. So the central cause for the current social ecological crisis is the structural separation of modern cap capitalist economies. And I will describe that. It is a separation of what we consider as production and reproduction. The reason why we are presently not living in a sustainable way is because of this, this structure which, which uh, says that the theoretical, the theoretical perspective is very reductive. Uh, there's a theoretically reductive conception of economy. So when I speak about economy, 
uh, try to talk about how we can overcome this uh, structural separation. So these are my central thesis. So what we want to do is to have a new category of reproductivity. It's not only my uh, thesis, it's, it's the thesis of my colleague. Um,
also, uh, um, can also live a life the way they want it. It means that we, want, we have to have a regenerative nature, we have to leave a regenerative nature to future generations. And there are two dimensions of justice. Sustainability is a normative principle. Everybody who says uh, it doesn't have anything to do with sustainability has to leave the room right now. We have to think in a normative terms. Now, economy hates the normative uh, dimension. The economy is normative, absolutely normative, and maybe somebody would uh, disagree with me, but the economy is normative. It's, 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 it means we have to have a justice among um, generation, generations, meaning that we have to be intragenerational. We have to make sure that first and foremost, the, the needs or the basic needs of the poor are met. We have to make sure that justice exists between the generations and between North and South today. Sustainability at the same time has something to do with integration. Economy, the ecology and the social dimension have to be uh, harmonized. There is no economic sustainability. There is no just ecological sustainability. And also just there is no just a social uh, um, sustainability. There is only sustainability that combines all these three, the economic, the ecological, and the social factor. The definition of sustainability which convinces me is the definition from uh, my colleagues from the Social in, in, uh, Sustainability Research in Frankfurt. And I'm going to read this um, definition. Sustainable, sustainable development describes an open dynamic process that constantly needs to be redesigned. It describes the quality of a development process which constantly preserves and renews its own natural and social preconditions. This means that by engaging in economic practices, by using our daily work and also capital production, and by using nature for fulfilling our needs and producing goods, at the same time, what we're using for this production, we have to make sure that the nature is regenerated through that as well. We have to sustain and renew through shaping it newly. And now I'm coming to the category reproductivity. Reproductivity The definition is missing on my slide, sorry, but it was translated. Now, the category reproductivity is a category that has at the forefront the unity of productivity and productivity. It looks at all the process of production. So there is no difference between production and reproduction, or reproductivity and productivity. This means reproductivity, once you have, or claims an economy where the production of nature and work are combined in a very smart way. Therefore, it is considered to be a um, category of um, mediation. I could speak only about productivity, actually, but why do I put the re in the brackets? This rapid shows that today's economy still entails that separation because the economic system still has the separation system in there because it is separating reproductivity and productivity. Therefore, I'm still using the re in the brackets and trying to show that we are going to tr trans we are now in a transition phase. So. If we want to go into into process of productivity, then later we can leave out the the brackets. So 
L now, let me tell you the dimension of externalization, meaning when we take out the care, uh, uh, when you take out the care. So, for example, if you cook a meal in the evening, it's not considered as valuable as a, co as, uh, as a contribution. Now, if we see the meal cooked in a restaurant, then it's considered as being productive because it creates value, it creates growth, and it also promotes uh, wealth. Now, what ha happens with the social productivity if, for example, a professor marries his um, domestic worker? Is the social productivity rising or is this going to fall? Who's in favor of rising? And who's in favor of sinking? Well, it's sinking because the paid work is falling away. Because that work is now de being done by the, 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 the partner. However, the social productivity is um, falling. Now, for example, if they were to, divide, uh, to divorce again, the productivity will increase because she would offer her services in a marketable form. Now, this is the way how separation works. But if we look at the material basis, there is no need for that kind of separation. Now, everything that I'm talking about is not just what I think. It has a prehistory. It has already prepared by feminist ecological, uh, by feminist ecological economics. In the feminist economics discourse, for long, there has been the attempt to broaden the term labor. There was a debate about, about should uh, domestic work be paid or not. Now, today, we have a very comprehensive discussion on care and reproductive work. Now, with regard to the ecological economy, nature has been integrated or included as a natural capital. However, Daily, Daily Damien also included the inv investigation and the, the investment of waiting. Now, my colleagues in Greifswald, for example, the group of Barbara Muraka back then, they further developed it and now are discovering the productivity of nature. They've now seen nature as something thing vivid as something living. Now, the reproductive uh, section or dimension is included in the production, and this is where we are further developing this. Now, reproductivity is a processual category. As I said, there's paid and unpaid labor, there's uh, unpaid care work, there's subsistence work, there's voluntary work among this um, care work, and, uh, and we all see these dimensions if we really bring together the reproductive and productive dimension. And at the same time, the category reproductivity is a category of mediation. It's a process of mediation between humans and nature. By producing, we are shaping the nature as well. We are producing nature as well. Today, in this unconscious system, we are creating also the climate crisis, the climate change. Actually, it's a climate um, crisis. This climate crisis is an unthought byproduct of our way of production. We are the ones who created that crisis, nobody else. So if we are uh, doing our economy in a productive way, then we have to produce a, a nature, nature that is regionally productive as well, which on the long term is able to sustain life throughout generation. You all know the joke, possibly, and I'll tell it anyway. Two planets meet in uh, space, and one planet is very big and round, and the other one is just uh, uh, almost uh, destroyed, and that is the Earth. And the other one is saying, are you sick? And the other one is saying, well, I have humans, and then telling the other ones, oh, don't worry, this will also go away. So 
sustainability is our human problem. We created this problem. We are the one who have destroyed our nature. Hans Peter Dürr, who died a year ago, who received the alternative Nobel Prize, he said sustainability means to make life more vivid. Now, what does it mean if we speak about reproductive uh, processes, if we talk about mediation between nature and humans? So, what we often say that the phase one is the natural production and the second one is the human production. But the natural production comes first. The human production is a consumption of um, natural um, resources. We are converting natural resources for uh, into goods to satisfy our needs. In nature, things, uh, life is uh, enabled. Everything is uh, happening there in order to provide uh, production in the first place. In a Marxist way, we are saying we are creating labor force. However, by using the uh, uh, goods of consumption, they are then broken down to what is uh, usable and what is non-usable. The economic theory has not understood that we also have to speak about reduction. The natural reduction The natural reduction is the process of production of new natural products for the next period. My colleague Sabine Hofmaster is saying the waste for of today are the resources for tomorrow. We have to make sure that today's waste has to be qualitatively in a way that nature can reproduce again. So, to engage in a reproductive uh, economic practice, we have to make sure that we really see that um, we have the qualities are in such a way that nature can reproduce itself again and that they are sustainable. Reproductivity has two characteristics. It is an analytical um, character. It has an It is an analytical category, and it's also a constructive category. It calls for a revising of the economy according to new uh, values. How do we value the work that so far has not been uh, valued? And also, how do we revalue nature? The reproductivity also calls for caring. Barbara Adam, uh, my colleague, uh, she tells me that this word, Fosa, cannot be translated. That's why we use it in English as well. Well, we can use it in English as well, because it, it uh, points towards the future and integrating the future in today. Vorsorgende uh, reproductivity, vorsorgende Wirtschaften, or vorsorgende economy, is based on three principles of action. This is, uh, these are not my ideas. Uh, I'm a member of the network Vorsorgen des Wirtschaften, which has been working since 1992 uh, to um, uh, come up with a new economic concept, uh, including the categories of reproductivity and others. So we look towards the future. Um, we are um, uh, supposed to be a very uh, egoistic and, self and selfish beings. Uh, we uh, are competitive beings, uh, and but we uh, uh, try to um, 
uh, abandon these uh, these notions, and we want to um, have a new orientation or a new uh, value, the new value of the good life. Um, I only touched upon that. It is uh, based on the notions uh, from Amartya Sen, for example, and who says that uh, the good life means that uh, humans can evolve their capabilities, their faculties, in order to uh, be able to organize and shape their own life within nature and within society, uh, that they can uh, realize themselves uh, in a way. They have the potential, they can use the potential to realize, and they can use all their potentials. But, uh, but this has to go hand in hand with other um, opportunities that are afforded to people. I'm not somebody who's saying that we don't need growth, but it's the society who needs to decide which growth is needed. What I know is good paid care work has to be valued more and has to grow. For me, the caring um, economy is so important. And current, current Toronto has just um, uh, published a new book called Caring Democracy. Caring is not only a form of work. Caring for her is the basis for a sustainable uh, democracy. Now, Toronto writes here by saying that care contain, uh, um, includes everything with regard to what we do in order to sustain ourselves and our life and also to enable the continuation of life. This entails our self and, our, and the nature as well, the social uh, environment. And what she's trying to say is that to put everything into a complex web So basically, if we say that care is a central principle and further developed in the future is a caring uh, principle, that we have a different uh, imagine of human because the economists only, only see the homo economicus who is um, interested in profit maximization and has no social dimension and socialists know that it's absolutely wrong but economists haven't understood that and we have seen what the result of that is. Care is based on a human picture to see humans in relation with another. People without relations aren't able to live and they have to have na uh, uh, relations to one another and nature. Only when people relate to each other are we able to think about care and can organize their lives not only through uh, commodities. So care, care is human, entails human relations basically. So. Now, with regard to more about caring, I said earlier that we have to include the future. But what is future? Barbara Adrams, referring to Nicholas Luhmann, saying that we have different understanding of uh, future. Future for us, us today often is that what we see as present future. We are asking, what can the future do for us? Well, the it can maybe um, tackle the issue of the nuclear waste. But this future understanding is saying that future generations will find out or will figure out what to do with this nuclear waste. This is, a, this is an understanding of future which I'm not referring to. What I'm trying to say is, is that we need to imagine the future or shape the future by taking into consideration future generations. Now the question there is, what are, we go what are we doing for this future today? What can we do so that this future 
enables a good life. Imagine that we, we would be living 300 years and would have to live with that what our predecessors have left to us. We are the ones who have to deal with the natural waste. Now, from that perspective, we have never started with this energy. Of course, this energy is not sustainable. And to start a technology without knowing how to deal with the consequences today. What is very decisive here is that the caring economic um, practice entails uh, the factor of what can we do today in order to enable a sustainable future. Now, this caring principle also entails that if we don't know something, we sh shouldn't touch it. So caring means, or the caring principle means like, don't t touch uh, the stuff that you don't know, that you don't know of its consequences. And also accept that you cannot know everything. There are colleagues who say that we have to continue researching and once we understand the nature, then we'll be able to do everything right. But this is never going to happen. Caring for the organ means to be responsible for the future. And this also includes responsibility for the consequences of our actions. So to summarize my speech here is what means economy as a caring economic practice? What I said is we have to mediate between the productivity of humans and nature in terms of quantity, quality, quality, space, and time. So all these dimensions have to be taken into consideration, not only for nature, but also the different um, working processes. For example, how can we leave nature its own time, for example, so that it can reproduce the waste into something productive again, something productive again? Because today, in this um, speed that we live here, it's not possible. It's absolutely. Um, ridiculous, for example, to send children, for example, so early in the morning because this is how our society works. We have to send the children so early in the morning so that their parents can go to work. So we have to think about how much material or resources can we use up and how much care work are we able to provide. Now, we also have to look at everybody who is uh, designing these processes has to be involved in shaping the transformation processes. For example, we have to uh, enter into the consumption and, and uh, uh, processes and we have to go into politics as well. So what we need is a very new form of democracy. Now there where people are living and life as a spatial dimension the first new concepts of regional reproductive economy are emerging. It doesn't mean that everybody is um, used and required. A reproductive economy cannot even afford that. It cannot afford not to include everybody. We need everybody. Five more minutes. I'm in what, uh, now I'm talking about dimension of the transformation processes and I, in the group uh, with Barbara Moraka, we spoke about the material energetic dimension. What we're talking here about is renewable energies. The sun, for example, is shining for us eternally, possibly for millions of years still. But this is maybe a dimension that we can consider as eternal. We need renewable energies, and providing this renewable energy through technologies that are not destructive. So, for example, if we look at how we organize our solar energy, it's absolutely ridiculous how much resources are required for that. And we are dependent on other countries. So what happens if these countries don't provide the resources that we need for our technologies? Are we then going to wage wars? I'd like to talk about labor. In order to get to proper labor, we need to shorten working hours radically. 
we can no longer afford these long working hours. We need to shorten them. This is very, very important. Secondly, we need redistribution. Today, we still have a gender bias. Unpaid, unpaid work, unpaid care work is still done by women. 50% of care work needs to be done by men, ladies and gentlemen. And they have to claim that. Men have to claim that care work. They have to claim that. Care work is also badly paid on the market. We have a separation of income and work, and what we need is we also need unconditional basic in mark, uh, income. Sorry, we need to, to fight for an unconditional basic income. We have to give people the opportunity to evolve without necessarily having to work so hard. Now the. Other dimension is the cultural symbolic dimension. A sustainable economy requires or needs gen gender equality. And gender justice is not only a moral matter, but also forms the basis for a sustainable economy and innovation. We need everybody. We need to make decisions uh, based on everybody. Therefore, we need men in care work, but we also need women in uh, wage labor. Now, my next point is, who are the actors involved in order to bring about that transformation? We need everybody who experiments with new economic principles. And Baba Muraka, you spoke also about that, that what I wanted, uh, that, that I consider also as this new economic principles, for example, the economy of the common, good now the second is we need also a state we need a political power because the changes of the transformation process process is not a peaceful one reproductive economy caring autumn economy withdraws capitalist markets and that's also the profitable market and this is something that those uh, profiteers don't want to so it's a confrontation with these dominant uh, structures for that we also need a political counterpower to fight that I'd like to quote uh, Nancy Fraser she's saying that we need to understand that economy and society are structured in a dominant way We need for that to include the power of emancipation. The power of the eman emancipation is the anti-capitalist movement and also the women's movement. We need to include them. So they, we, the actors, the stakeholders the, who need to be involved are those who are looking at new forms of uh, practices. Thank you very much, Adelheid, for this wonderful speech. Let's start with a little bit of caring, please. There are so many seats here. Let's care for each other and let's have everybody have a seat. There is also security issues in sitting on the stairs. So please move to the middle of the rows. Let other people sit down. Let give us ourselves one minute to move and have everybody sitting down. Thank you. You can come further down. On the left, on, on your right side, there is a bunch of seats, please. Um, yeah, I need more. Yeah, kein Problem. Okay. Ich warte nur, dass die Leute sich gesetzt haben. Genau. Genau, Have a seat. There is more down here.
I have the great pleasure to introduce to you our second speaker. Sorry, before doing that, just an information. For those of you who want to know more about what Adelheid Bizeka has already talked about, we have many different events today, such as right after this a panel discussion, um, Degrowth of Feminist Perspective, for example, which will be at 11 in the HS9, and we will also have at the same time a world cafe in which we will have a chance to discuss, am discuss among, among each other these perspectives. So moving on to our next wonderful speaker, um, as I said, it's very important that the, de that the degrowth discourse is open to different perspectives. Federico de Maria said in the, very f in the opening evening something very important. We should not think of degrowth as a new model to export all over the world, just as we have exported development. So it's very important to listen to other voices and other perspectives. And this is something that we have been doing in these days and we are doing in this conference. And this is why it's so important that Sunita Narayan accepted to join us to this conference. She would have come to the conference, but unfortunately she couldn't, but she will be uh, live streamed per Skype and give us a talk. Sunita Narayan is an Indian environmentalist and political activist, as well as a major proponent of the green concept of sustainable development. Narayan has been with the India-based Center for Science and Environment since 1982. She is currently the director of the center and the director of the Society for Environmental Communications and publisher of the fortnightly magazine Down to Earth. She will give us a speech uh, with this title, A Right to Grow, Meeting the Needs of All Within the Planetary Boundaries. So help me welcome him very warmly because she's far away, Sanita Narayan. <laughs> Thank you very much for inviting me to the conference. I'm very happy to be with you and very happy that I am in Delhi, which uh, where uh, it is rained this morning and um, we've had a really bad monsoon uh, with drought all around and so today is a good day for us as well. So I'm delighted to be with you in Leipzig and I look forward to talking today to explain some of our, of our concerns. The key issue for us, and I think the conference in my view has framed the right question finally. We began uh, talking about environment and development as way back as 1992, when the buzzword was sustainable development. And by the time the world reached the Rio conference once again in 2012, we were talking about a green economy. But in both, but in both cases of sustainable development, development or the green economy, in my view, the world did not free. And the question is what you are asking today, which is, do we have the right to grow? How do we meet the needs of all within the planetary boundaries? And that to me is the core issue as we move ahead. We need to find a way that the world can grow economically to meet the needs, the aspirations of the poorest in the world. We need to find a way that we can share the resources of the world with all. And we also need to do all this making sure that we can live within the planetary boundaries. And that is the challenge. That is the core of the environmental issue. And this is when we know today that we are faced with a warming world. 
We know that the fact is that all our mitigation efforts till now are turning out to be too little, too late. The future is not far. The future, in, in fact, is here. In India, we are experiencing more and more extreme weather events. We are getting more hailstorms, more variable cold, more heat events, and we are beginning to see more extreme rainfall events. Now, you must understand that in a country like India, India where the real finance minister is actually the monsoon, our rain, our rain season, then a more extreme a more extreme monsoon means huge impacts on the livelihoods of the very poor in the country. And this is the ironies that we face, that the poor in the world who are least responsible for climate change are its worst victims. And this is unacceptable. This has to be unacceptable, not only to you and me who are sitting in this one big hall, but to the world around us. And the and the question has to be, how do we move ahead? And so what I will try and do today, this morning, is to discuss with you the two realities that I see. The big opportunity that we must grasp at this moment, and also the big course correction that we must bring in the environmental movement of the world, so that we can actually find a way to have a secure future for all. We need inclusive growth. We need to make sure that that growth reaches the poorest of the world. So the first reality. The first reality is that we must accept that climate change is not just about cutting emissions that are linked to growth. Climate change is about, uh, is about uh, sharing uh, growth between people and between nations. And this makes it really tough in an intensely unequal world. It is no surprise then that the world is still and that the world is still struggling with this reality. In the Framework Convention on Climate Change had accepted the fact that the rich world will reduce its emissions and make space for the poor to grow. I keep calling it that that was the age of innocence. That was the age when we all believed that the world was just and fair, that the rich would reduce their emissions so that the poor could grow, and that we would all reinvent the way that we had, we would do development so that we would all be able to share within the, live within the planetary boundaries. That was 1992. But today, that same situation is even more difficult. It is even more contested. In 1992, there was only a very small group of countries who were claimants of the global atmospheric space. Now there are many more. In 1992, industrialized countries accounted for 70% of the annual emissions. Today, they account for 40% of the annual emissions. But the problem is that the rich did not reduce and make space. The rest of the countries have grown and added emissions to an already heated world. And this is why we are running out of space, we are running out of time. And, and this is even more complicated because climate change is not just about the problem of present contribution of the gases that have already been emitted but which are a source of the crisis today, what we call the historical contribution. And this is why the world, in some senses, in spite of all the talk, in spite of all the times the world leaders have come together to say that they will do something on climate change, and this is when the science is clear, more than ever, that action is imperative. We still find that we are doing too little and too late. But the reality, and this is the reality that I began to talk about, the reality is that we need an effective and an ambitious, agree ambitious agreement, but an effective and ambitious agreement can only be possible if it is a fair agreement. 
it is in everybody's interest to put to, to believe to build a collaborative agreement with rich committed yesterday the poor will do so tomorrow so it is about building a cooperative agreement which is built of fairness which is built on equity and this has to be the basis of our discussions we have to recognize that without an agreement which is first fair and equitous we will not be able to have a, an ambitious agreement on climate change the second reality is that the world cannot cut emissions until we discuss seriously the options of what your conference is contemplating the growth we need those options on the table we need to know how we can actually build economic futures without destroying um, uh, the earth we, we, we need this because we know that mitigation today is not adding up science is clear action is not we know today that we are on a pathway of a pathway of at least 3 degrees if not more of centigrade of temp uh, uh, centigrade of temperature rise and we need to make sure that we can take very aggressive action to reduce emissions which basically means that we need trajectories that are that are transformational we cannot afford to have transitional trajectories of emission reduction anymore and the reason is that the world has a double challenge we need to reduce emissions but on the other hand we also need to increase emission to meet the needs of all which is why as i said the world needs the transformational technologies and no longer the transitional technologies so those are really our two realities the inability of the world to to move ahead on climate change until it has a fair agreement an equitable agreement and to the, the imperative that we need to find ways of having transformational change not just transitional change those are the realities but there is also an opportunity the opportunity is for us to really and for us to really understand once for all that the current way of current way of development which is resource, which is resource intent extractive which is capital intensive capital intensive and so is highly inequitous highly inequitous and highly polluting will need to be reinvented we need to be able to frame our questions today to say how do we how do we meet the needs of all and get needs of all and yet stay within planetary boundaries if we combine the issues of justice and equity with the imperative of sustainability the new answers that is the opportunity take india and it's from india which you will which will help you to understand the chat one if you look at india we are relatively poor yet we are fast developing yet we are fast developing how can we get it right how can we get it right how can a country like india reinvent growth without pollution how can we change our trajectory of trajectory of development so that we can give well being well uh, well being to millions of our people and yet not add to greenhouse gas emissions from coal mobility to all and yet not add to local or global emissions and when i say this you must also understand the scale of the in india india's population as you know is over a billion we still have to reach energy for basic needs to millions of people 30% of people use kerosene for lighting 700 million people use firewood for cooking so the scale of our energy need is massive we need to increase our energy generation 
we have to find a way to meet the needs of all of all the question we have is can we do this differently can we do something that the world has not and to answer this really we need to reframe the question by asking can we reach energy to all but can it be clean energy to all is that possible it is possible if india and the rest of the world was to actually rethink the question today we talk about clean energy as a goal in itself we talk about clean energy and we think about renewable energy and we think that if we can get solar energy we have met the ultimate goal in the world but in my view solar energy is an half answer it is not even an answer if we cannot combine clean energy with the question about energy access for all if you do solar for solar then we in india we do what large parts of the world have been doing not germany but many other parts have been doing which is to build renewable energy and then feed it all to a grid so build large solar plants like large fossil fuel plants and then connect it all to grid systems but this means that the people who already have energy also get access to a clean source of energy the question that we should be asking is that can we do renewable energy clean energy to meet the needs of all because even now when countries are talking about renewables or talking about moving out of coal at best they are moving into gas and they are moving into gas countries like the us because they have suddenly discovered large amounts of shale gas and so it is convenient for them to be green they are not looking at shale gas or gas as meeting the ultimate objective which is to meet the needs of all in the world so if the question then is reframed to become clean energy for energy access then you have to think about the answer differently as well in vast parts of the world the grid has reached but supply is unreliable supply is unreliable in some parts there is no grid at all so the question then becomes can we can we use solar energy in a decentralized way through mini grids so that people in rural areas poor people can actually get first access to clean sources of energy rather than energy which is fossil fuel based which comes to them through a large grid and that completely changes the paradigm of growth you start looking at energy as an enabler you start looking at clean energy as a way to bring the transformation that we are talking about that we so desperately need in the world but we but when we start doing this we also have to be clear that this is not cheap it is not going to be easy the plan in india is to clear to create such a framework to use a feed in tariff to pay the differential between this energy which is a decentralized form of energy generated through mini grids and the grid based energy source which is fossil fuel based and is still cheaper but the problem is that there are very few business models to reach the poorest in the world we know how to build a large power plant a large nuclear plant a large nuclear plant a large solar a large solar plant and connect those plants to people who are cheap. the transformation we require is to make sure that this really the needs of the poorest in the world the most marginalized in the world happen with quality and affordable service now this is where the world needs to think out of the box we need to think of a global agreement which is based on rights which makes emission reductions a condition in the rich world but also links it to a global feed in tariff regime 
so that you can actually do the same as we are thinking in India across the world. Make sure that we can link clean energy to the needs of the poorest in the world. The world. Make sure that we can to feed and pay the differential between a cheap source of energy, a relatively most expensive source of energy, a cheaper way to supply energy through the grid, a more expensive way to supply energy through mini grids, through decentralized energy, do that through a, a feed-in tariff, a global feed-in tariff regime, reach millions and millions and billions across the world. Make the trans that the world so desperately requires. That in mind is not degrowth, it is growth with a human face. The example that we give you is one of mobility. We know today that the way we talk about uh, dealing with cars and the police, we're talking about hybrid cars, we're talking about biofuel cars. But that doesn't, that doesn't deal with the crisis that the large numbers of vehicles are creating on our roads. The fact is that cars, cars today add to local air pollution. They're also responsible for global air pollution, for climate change. And that all countries of the world, including Germany, are behind, are behind the problem. Every Every time you think you have fixed one pollutant, you have to deal with, and you have to invest more money in dealing with it, in dealing with it. And all this time, the, car, the cars in the world are actually adding to this massive, massive pollution challenge that we have. And we know that the answer really is to reinvent, to reinvent mobility so that we can move people and we can move people and not cars. The question is how will this, we are exploding with cars and yet we know that the people who use cars are still a small majority. Less than 15% of Delhi still drives a car. Yet we have pollution, we have congestion. Most of Delhi still takes a bicycle or takes a bus, a bus. Not because it is rich, but because it is poor. And the question for us is, how can we become rich and yet take a bus or yet take a bicycle? And this is a difficult question. Please, let us not underestimate it. The fact is that the cards are stacked against us. There are no role models for us to emulate. There is big corporate interest which is pushing for a car-centric model. For a car-centric model, current economic thinking tells us that the more we consume, the so whether it is aspiration, whether it is needs, whether it is corporate greed or economic thinking, all converge together to make the world absolutely secure within its car-centric model. At most where countries have invested in public transport, it is always an afterthought. It is after manufactured, they have been bought, they have been sold. It is not at the core. That is the problem with this toxic growth model that we have today. And so everything in that sense is works against reinvention. Everything drives us to drive more, use more resources, emit, and then clean up. And the question that we have is, what can we do so that we do not first pollute and then clean up? I believe that the answers are there. In my own city, city what we are saying is that we will have to reinvent because we cannot provide mobility to all. The fact is, as I said earlier, if only 15% of Delhi drives and already 26% of Delhi's roads are Delhi's land area is under roads, we just do not have the roads to be able to meet the needs of all. 
So if we want mobility for all, all we will have to reinvent the model. This is really the challenge at the global level as well. We do not have the space to meet the needs of all in the current growth economic model that we have adopted. So we have to reinvent, we have to think differently, to think differently, we have to drastically change so that we can change the way we do mobility. In this case, we put it at the center of our thinking. So in this case, we have to think a very broad space based on equity, based on the fact who uses most road space gets the largest share. And that has to be the global model even when it comes to climate change. Let me then discuss with you my final two points which are about course correction. As I said, if we want all this, if we accept the reality, we know the opportunity, we will have to make certain changes in the way we do environmentalism in the world so that we can actually make this happen. What are those course corrections? Firstly, we have to understand and make a difference between the environmentalism of the poor versus the environmentalism of the rich. In the environmentalism of the rich, which is where Germany is and large parts of my country, the urban middle class are, the, we deal with environmental issues after we become rich. We look at them as a fallout of wealth accumulation and wealth creation. So the problem of toxic air or the problem of garbage is about cleaning up after we have generated it. This is the environmentalism of the rich, where we keep investing in technology to deal with the present, and which is why I keep saying that in the environmentalism of the rich or the middle class, we are garbage managers and nothing more. But in the environmentalism of the poor, there is a very different situation. In the environmentalism of the poor is what we in India are witnessing today. We have many protests today happening against pollution, against deforestation, against the takeover of grazing lands, fishing areas, beaches. These are protests not by the rich, <coughs> but by the poor in my country. And these people are protesting not because environment is a luxury for them, but it is about survival. They are saying that the de development that will come will make them even poorer. It will take away their livelihoods, it will destroy their life, it will add to pollution. And so they are forcing us to rethink what we mean by growth. They are forcing us in many ways to do what is impossible in our world, which is forcing us to share growth. And governments who are trained in the knowledge, my government, which is trained in the knowledge of the West, worry about limits, they worry about constraints. But I believe this is the opportunity that can lead us to a different tomorrow. The environmentalism of the poor tells us that the resources is limited, we need to tread lightly on earth. It tells us there is an alternative way. We can build economies that will benefit large numbers of people, that sustainably use the land, that share the water resources. That is the environmentalism of the poor. Now to do this, and this, and this is the second course correction we need, we also we need we also need ideas and technology, we need ideas and technologies for the future. The crisis today is that the technologies for environmental management have been developed by a developed by a world when it is rich. They are unaffordable. They are unaffordable for vast numbers of people, and they will not work. Will not work. In my view, and that is the bottom line that I would like to put out to you. Any technology for environmental management is not affordable, not be sustainable. 
So affordability and equity are at the core of the challenge of sustainability. If we really frame the environmental issue saying that unless we have affordability, unless we have equity, we will not have sustainability, we will begin to move in the direct to move in the direction that you and I desperately want. And if we want to do this, we will have to look for answers in the ways of the past. We will have to look for it in the knowledge of the very poor, in what we call the unproductive systems, the systems that modern knowledge discounts. Today in towns, today in India, cities are cities are growing. But we are doing what the rest of the world has done, what has done when it comes to our water, when it comes to our waste. We are bringing water from past, bringing water from past distances. We are discharging our waste into uh, taking it long distances. We do not have the big challenges of pollution. But if we were to reinvent this so that we could actually look at the knowledge of the very poor, do rainwater harvesting at one level, uh, use local water resources efficiently, efficiently optimize it, and use the most modern technology so that we would recycle and reuse every drop of wastewater. Do not create waste. Do not first create waste and then treat it. Treat waste as a resource to begin with. If we were to redo this, we would think about reinventing the flush toilet we would not destroy the nitrogen cycle of the world. We would actually reinvent the way we did resource management. But we would do this learning that sustainability will not work if, if the answers are not affordable. And finally, to do this course correction, you, we will also have to look for answers in nature. We will have to understand the art, the science, and the strength of nature in the answers that it provides us. Today, human beings in our technology and in the answers that we have chosen, we the answers that we have chosen, we use concentrated energy such as coal and oil, local air pollution, and global climate change. But if we understood the ways of nature, we would shift to weaker sources of energy like solar, or move to using rainfall, as, we, as I just talked about. We would not wait for the rain to first concentrate, get concentrated in rivers and aquifer. We would not look for energy to get first concentrated as coal, to use it uh, for, for, for our development. So the way, as I said, in, if we were to learn from nature, we would use energy in decentralized grids not to give people one solar panel or another, but to build the world's smartest grid fueled by millions of mini or, uh, or micro solar plants. This then becomes the new answer. We know we have to meet the needs of millions. We know we need development. We cannot meet the fundamental needs of health care, of water, of energy, of very large numbers of people. So the world needs growth. The question is, how can we have that growth so that it is equitous and so it is sustained? We can do this if we reinvent. We can do this if we deepen democracy to keep listening to people. We can do this if we look for alternatives in technology. And most importantly, we can do this if we have the courage to think and be different in the world. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Sunita, for this wonderful talk, which was very provoking to, to all of us. And we'll have a chance in the course of the day to jump into this discussion, to deepen the discussion. We have, again, a bunch of events in this conference. Unfortunately, you are not here to discuss with us further. Um, to, to go into these provocative um, uh, challenges that you have given to us, uh, there are, as I said, many different events today. I just mentioned one, but don't go everybody of you in that one because obviously you will be full. Uh, like we have an event about the alliances for degrowth between Global North and South, which would be a chance to discuss that further. And it will be um, right now in this very room after the talk. But there are many others events discussing about the differences, the possible alliances between different models. Um, along the whole conference. I have an important announcement. As, as I said before, there are also many events discussing a feminist perspective. One of these, um, many of the, was the World Cafe, which will be um, in, uh, will be not in the seminar room 310, but uh, in the foyer, foyer be, um, just, uh, um, uh, you don't go into the room, it's, it's HS9, but you don't go into the room, you just meet before the room. And then you do the word cafe there. Um, there are, okay, so excuse me. <laughs> um, again, if you want to make to have more discussion on these topics and you don't find a place where we can do it, you can you can still organize an open space workshop, self-organized. Now we have a break and everything is going to go on at 11 o'clock. Thank you very much for being here.